Good day, everyone, and welcome to In the Spotlight on IKTV Channel 112. Remember, it is all about you. My name is Jillian Crookshank, and today in the spotlight we have with us, we have New York attorney, uh, author, and public speaker, Miss Juanita Headley. And um, she is a strong advocate against child sexual abuse and human trafficking. So today she's going to be with us talking about those two topics. And also we're going to talk about her book, Can You Keep a Secret? Let's get right into it, Juanita. Good day, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. How did you end up here in SVG? Now, you're a licensed New York attorney. Mm -hmm. What brought you to SVG? What brought you to the Caribbean? Around four months ago, I was invited to speak for a Zoom program. And having received that invitation, I decided this would give me an opportunity to come to St. Vincent. And even though there was a lockdown, I decided to not allow that to dissuade me from getting on a plane. I therefore quit my job around two weeks ago on the Friday. On Saturday, I booked my flight, and by Wednesday, 19th August, I was here. Hold on. You quit your job just like that without further thought. You know what? I'm just going to do this. That is pretty brave. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was circumstances out of my control. Okay. And, and when I share my story, I encourage people that even if God says yes, but your boss and your spouse, your family are saying no, you've got to go with what God is saying. And I asked my employer for time off. She said no. And the circumstances came about where I walked out at 11.08 mm -hmm. p.m. that Friday. I was 11.08 in the morning. I said, I will no longer be working here. I handed my notice. And the very next day, I had my flight booked. Wow. <laughs> That's extraordinary. So yes. you're definitely serious about coming here. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Tell us about did the meeting eventually the, the meeting how does that coincide with SVG? What and did you tell me why SVG? Because um what happened? I don't remember you, you were saying it. I believe that because of some of the work I've been doing internationally, doing podcasts every week, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Zooms every Thursday, and doing global interviews, Ghana, India, and sharing this with people, I believe that sometimes individuals see the message, see the information, and they realize what I'm sharing is what needs to be heard in, for example, SVG. That's how the invitation came about. Now, this person and myself have been in contact for a year. It was meant to have actually been in July. However, due to circumstances outside of my control, it was canceled and postponed. I asked them, can we instead have it for the 28th of August, which is the day after my birthday. My birthday is the 27th. And I said, can we push it till the 28th? And they said, absolutely. Now, truth be told, I lacked faith. It may not seem like it when I quit my job, I lacked faith. And because my boss had said no, even though God, said, God had said yes, because my boss had said no, I said, can we postpone it till September 4? So in fact, the program will be happening September 4 via Zoom, but I'll also be in the church in person, which for me is a great thing because with the lockdown and everything that was going on, many people would simply say, well, forget about going to SVG virus lockdown. But for me, I knew the Lord was sending me here and he made a way where there seemed to be no way. Awesome. Awesome. Now, uh, you are, like I said before, you're an advocate of human trafficking and child sexual abuse why is this cause so dear to your heart i mean what got you advocating and you say you do pro bono work also that's so correct why did how did you get into this well around eight years ago i started volunteering around the world completely unpaid and what i would say when i went to the u.s i went there with a desire to study to become an attorney i failed my exam and as a result of that i decided after going to jamaica to stay in the US. It didn't make any sense to go back home and then return to retake the exam. By that time, the money had run out. I stayed, the Lord made provision, he provided, provided. Eventually, after taking the exam three times, I finally passed. And despite spending around four years in the US, six months in, then crossed the border and return, I have been an unpaid pro bono attorney because I don't have a visa, a green card, or a work permit. So I provide free legal advice to individuals who are homeless, indigent, immigrants who are illegal, at the end of the day, according to the laws of the land in the U.S., I am able to provide free legal advice to those individuals. Okay. It does not breach my visa. I'm on a tourist visa. And so for that reason, I provide the services. I'm qualified. I'm licensed. I like to help people. That is my desire. So that is why I've been doing that work. And then why did I start to do this more full-time, traveling, sharing the message? I would say for me, my own personal story of being a victim of childhood sexual abuse, 
by my mother's first husband from four to ten. That is really what spurred me on to try as best as I could to safeguard and protect other victims and survivors from going through what I have been through. All right. You spoke about um, doing some traveling and you told me previously that you're actually doing some work with the um, Royal St. Vincent and the Grenadines Police Force here. You're working with them in collaboration. Is it only with the event that you're doing here? What kind of work have you done so far, not just with um, SVG, but throughout the country and all over the world? Well, thus far, I've had the opportunity to be part of a program that was hosted at a church, and that was something that the police were actually working with. And they kindly invited me. That was on August 27th. So I had the opportunity to share my knowledge and expertise on the topic of human trafficking and child abuse. I've also done a program with them, which was on Thursday, the 3rd of September. And that one was at New Testament Church of God, Wilson Hill. The program was, again, discussing the very same topic. It has been a great honor and privilege to collaborate with the police because this is a very important message. And I feel that people may not take Miss Headley so seriously if I'm just a stranger from outside lands, but if they can see that I am collaborating with their local police, then that, that endorsement changes the dynamics. Thus far, I've traveled to 38 countries, and I've been taking my message of human trafficking, child sexual abuse prevention around the world, I'm a public speaker, I speak on various platforms because it's an important message. I've been doing my work primarily in the Philippines, Trinidad and Tobago, India, Ghana, Indonesia, and I'm always looking for ways to get the message further out there. Why those specific countries? Truth be told, they fell into my lap. I absolutely didn't choose it. I'm a strong believer in Jesus Christ and he directs my steps. It, truth be told, around six years ago, I did a public speaking course in the US. I got a full scholarship, it was $1,000. DECA communication, it taught me everything that I needed to know. Doing that course and having a year to practice and implement it, the following year when I was invited to be a speaker at the judges conference in Tobago, I jumped at the chance. After all, who wouldn't want a free vacation? I went there, had a great time, enjoyed what I did, but truth be told, I think I was appalling. Despite that, I love my work and I said I wanted to stay longer. Long story short, I ended up returning to Trinidad a week later and I've been going back ever since. So for five years, I've been going to Trinidad and Tobago sharing the message. And the sad thing is that there's still a lot of people who have not heard what I have to say. Okay. With the Philippines, I was volunteering in an orphanage. I do a lot of work out there. And the individual who runs the orphanage invited me to speak in front of the police, social workers, and one of the mayors. That opportunity fell in my lap. Coming to St. Vincent, it was just about having the right connections, meeting the police, and then having a program on August 27th, my birthday, and being invited and welcome to speak. I don't knock on doors looking for work. It just literally just happens. I believe that the Lord just sort of lays things out and then directs my steps to where he wants me to go. As I tell people, I'm not a speaker, I'm a chef and a lawyer. And even though I'm a lawyer, my passion is baking. So really, I'm just a chef. I love to cook, I love to talk and fellowship. But the Lord knows Juanita loves to talk and I'm going to make her a speaker. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, out of all your experience, mm -hmm. all right, with public speaking and the various places that you went to, not just regionally, but internationally, mm -hmm. What are the five top countries do you think are high on the list for human trafficking and sexual tra child abuse? I'd say that's a difficult question to answer because when we think about the size of a country, the population, in a place like India, we have a huge issue with trafficking, which is domestic. We hear about individuals who are sometimes drugged, drugs are placed in their food, then they wake up in a cage, they wake up in another part of the country. A lot of people, when they think of trafficking, they're thinking of the movie Taken, which I have not seen and refuse to see. Trafficking is not kidnapping. It is not smuggling. And so my desire is to educate people on domestic trafficking. Do okay, so what mm -hmm. would you say trafficking is? Define trafficking. For me, I use examples to define. I do not use the legal definition. For myself, I simply say, in my opinion, which is important, in my opinion, when there are men and women in sex, you have sex trafficking. When you have restaurants, businesses, and establishments, in my opinion, you have labor trafficking. When you have sick people, people with ailments, in my opinion, you have organ trafficking. Okay. In other words, human trafficking takes place everywhere in the world, including in St. Vincent. For example, you could be born in Kingstown, live in Kingstown, and be trafficked in Kingstown. 
If your mum or dad is your pimp, you don't even have to leave your bedroom. And that's what's important. And so for me to answer which country has the most trafficking, it is difficult to answer that because domestic trafficking is a big issue and often hard to see. Domestic is when a Trinidad person is trafficked in Trinidad. A person from St. Vincent is trafficked in St. Vincent. Somebody from China trafficked in China. Okay. It's hard to identify because some of the victims may go to work, to school, to college, but they're being exploited, maybe at night being sold for sex or domestic servitude. And so it's very hard because the numbers tell us one thing, but the reality is a lot worse. Okay. All right. So there is no research that has shown... Um, because I think a few years back, we were very low on the list of human trafficking. How we ended up there, I do not know. Um, and I think they said they were using our cabins, our seas, to transport, to do human trafficking. So from all that data, there is nothing that would say, like, which countries you haven't heard of or done any research that said um, like the top 10 countries that are on the human trafficking list, no? For me personally, I don't do research on numbers because when I if give the topic, give the discussion, give the conversation to people, I'm talking to lay men and women. I do a lot of reading, but I do not read on numbers. I'm not a statistician. When I talk to people, I want to make it human. I want to make it become real. Numbers become overwhelming. What I do when I present, I share stories. I read articles and I share stories of real life people. The numbers overwhelms and often can frighten and even make individuals paranoid. What I do know is that in places like the US, there is a massive issue of human trafficking, same as in the UK. Human trafficking victims in the UK are primarily British citizens, which most people don't realize. Of course, we have Eastern Europeans coming in. We know about that. Same as in India, human trafficking, for example, brick kilns, factories, it's primarily local people. For me, when I'm speaking to primary school children, secondary school children, statistics will not serve any purpose. The audience that I have are just men and women, regular people, who often, in my opinion, don't think about the topic or care about the topic. And the reality is when people hear I'm going to talk about human trafficking, if they're honest and transparent, they either do not attend the program or they say they think it's going to be boring. If I come with numbers, it will overwhelm the audience. Instead, I use stories of people I've met or things I've read about and make it more human. My desire is to educate people how to protect their family members, how to protect the children around them. Their numbers will not do that. Facts, for example, what red flags to look out for, signs and identifiers, is more useful than telling you a million victims in England. How does that help? It doesn't. It could create fear of your family members in England. And as a Christian, I'm not here to create a spirit of fear. The Bible says we should have power and have a sound mind. If I say in St. Vincent, there are 50 cases of trafficking, then people will be suspecting their friends and neighbors. I don't want to put people on high alert to become paranoid. I want people to have the tools to identify. There doesn't need to be paranoia. The Bible says people perish for lack of knowledge. When you have the information, you can identify. Paranoia will not protect anybody. Even the sexual offenses registry, I was asked that question recently if I agree. And I don't, which I'm sure if you're happy to, I can explain thereafter. Okay, thank you. Also, now, in your short time in St. Vincent, I'm sure you've done some research, you know, um, about St. Vincent and the Grenadines and where we stand in child molestation, domestic violence, human trafficking. Let, let me, uh, tell me real quick, um, what laws or legislation would you like to see passed to help prevent and protect against child sexual abuse? And not just St. Vincent, but in the Caribbean on a whole. I think first and foremost, we have to consider that it's important that the laws are only as good as the legislators. On the back of that, I feel that as a Christian, we've got to use wisdom in the decisions that we make, God-given wisdom. And I say that because often we become emotional when we hear things and we may consider one crime is worse than another. I believe in prison, in jail time and punishment, but I believe in rehabilitation. I had the opportunity to go to the Bella prison and to spend time with these individuals. Every one of them has something to offer and maybe their skills and talents should remain in the prison to safeguard the rest of us. For me, I don't believe in castration or the death penalty, but I believe in prison and jail time. 
What I think is important is that the countries need to be able to build cases carefully so that way they have sufficient evidence that when the case goes to court, it does not get thrown out because there is insufficient DNA. This is missing. That's one of the challenges. If there are insufficient CSI, crime scene investigations, then when a case has occurred, an incident has occurred, then the evidence is taken thereafter. It can be destroyed or tampered with. So that is important. We need more CSIs. We need to make sure that when we build a case, that there are no holes in that case, no room for doubt. At the end of the day, innocent people go to prison all the time, and that needs to change around the world. Also, I feel that it's important to educate teachers and those who are in positions of power how to respond to children who are abused, how best to support children. Because often in schools, a child may be badly behaved, may be disruptive, certain behaviors are exhibiting, and often, even in the West, our response is to exclude them. Instead, we need to have laws that will protect the children in the sense of there's more freedom. A child is disruptive, rather than kicking them out and saying, OK, this is the school's policy and procedure, let's find a way to support that child. And then on the back of that, what I think is important is when it comes to children disclosing things at school, often if they have a counselor or speak to a teacher or a staff member, the laws of most lands are that when a disclosure is being made, the staff member has to tell the child before the disclosure if you tell me it's suicidal, if you tell me you'll harm somebody, if you tell me, I have to report that. And I feel that that needs to change. I feel instead of saying that, when a child wants to disclose, the staff member needs to listen to the disclosure first of all. Once they've heard it, communicate to the child, for example, you've told me you want to hurt your brother. That is not okay, and this is what we need to do. Because I feel by telling the child in advance, if you tell me this, suicide, if you tell me that, murder, if you tell me that, sexual assault, when you tell that child these various things, when you provide me that information, I'm going to disclose that. Quite often, the child will not tell you whatever it is they're going through. And the fact of the matter, think about it logically. If you want to protect somebody from being abused, from someone committing suicide, you need the knowledge first. And the laws at the moment are parents, counselors, therapists have to make a warning before the conversation begins. If you tell me these things, I will have to breach that. I have a problem with that because for me personally, I've met even in your country, women and girls who have disclosed to me thus far of being victims of sexual abuse. And they've never disclosed before. I've met men in the Caribbean who disclosed abuse for the first time because maybe they tried before and they got that little speech i'm going to have to tell somebody and they did not disclose so that i believe really needs to change so do you see your cause making any difference in any of the countries that you've been to most certainly i would say the work that i'm doing thus far has impacted and changed people's lives and that's what i'm hearing from people having been on my facebook having received whatsapp messages People continuously communicate with me and share about how the information I have given in a talk on the radio has empowered them, has impacted them. I had a young lady who was in a domestically abusive relationship actually reach out to me following the presentation. After having heard my discussion on human trafficking and child abuse, she identified as having no freedom of movement. And as a result of that, she left the relationship she was in, which was abusive. Another young lady actually told me that she'd been sexually abused and she needed help to disclose that with her father. I spoke to the father with her consent and just told him, your daughter needs to talk to you about something. Some few months later, she messaged me, thank you so much, Ms. Headley. I spoke to my dad. I have parents who actually have told me that from hearing my message, they no longer walk around the house naked. From hearing my message, they've stopped to bath their son and daughter together. What I will say, though, is that some people misunderstand my message and develop paranoia. And that is not my desire whatsoever. My desire is for people to be able to protect their children because they've been given the tools to do so. And for me, I notice you've said aware, and awareness is something people talk about a lot. I personally do not use that term. For me, I didn't come all the way here, quit my job to raise awareness. In my opinion, awareness is like saying, today is a day of the week. And the other person would say, I'm aware. 
Awareness, in my opinion, is knowing and doing nothing. I quit my job, got on a flight here for the purpose of educating and empowering people with the tools to act. Often we talk aware, 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 nothing is changing. I want to go one step further, bring my message to a community and for change to take place. That is what I want. I don't just want to come like a whirlwind leave and everything goes back to normal. I want there to be a 180 degree transformation from how things were before and that is important. And people do talk to me. I know of a person who's in an abusive relationship mentally, physically, emotionally, sexually with the spouse. As a result of my lockdown lessons that are every Thursday via Zoom, she actually left her husband and she said, your Zoom programs every week has given me the strength to do so. I don't understand how that correlates. I'm not talking about divorce as a Christian. I don't believe in that. But her safety is paramount. She's in an abusive relationship and she has moved away from that. And she feels what I have shared has empowered her, which is an amazing thing. She was not made aware. She was empowered to leave that relationship. And that's fantastic. Definitely. So... Um, while you're here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, would you be doing any of these um, online Zoom meetings? It's interesting you ask. I actually have a Zoom on, had a Zoom on Thursday, the, the 3rd of September. However, at the time of that Zoom, I'm double booked. And so during that Zoom, I actually had a friend come and speak on the platform. It was called Testimony Time. The Zoom meetings are 5 p.m. St. Vincent time every single week, excluding my birthday, which is August 27th, and Christmas Day if it falls on a Thursday. These Zoom meetings started on April 30th. The Lord woke me out of my bed a couple of nights before and told me the name of the program, what the program title and slogan would be. He woke me out of my bed on Sunday I started advertising on Tuesday. By Thursday, the room was filled. I was amazed by that. With two days of advertisement, how did it happen? I don't know, only the goodness of God. And I've been running those sessions every week. The topic is human trafficking and child abuse, but I also have a session on relationships and testimony time. So the most recent program, which was on the 3rd of September, Thursday, that was at 5 p.m. St. Vincent time via Zoom, but I was elsewhere. So I was in two places at once. I didn't let people know that, but okay. I had another lady hold the meeting for me because testimony time is a great opportunity to encourage others with uplifting and inspiring stories. Even though I discuss abuse and trafficking every week, that is too much dreary, depressing things to speak and focus on. The testimony time flips the switch. Whether people have faith or no faith, we can all inspire each other. And that is the purpose of the meeting. My desire is to keep running these forever. That's my desire. Mm -hmm. All right. You said your cause came about um, because of your personal experience with childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Now, and because of that, you've written a book. It's called, Can You Keep a Secret? Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to basically use this opportunity to tell us about your book. Why, why that name? Why Can You Keep a Secret? Certainly. Can You Keep a Secret comes out of my personal story. My mother's first husband sexually abused me from four to ten. It was attempted rape. A lot of people don't understand what it means. Quite simply, it was so close to the crime of rape, but that did not happen. As a result of what I went through, I tried to communicate to my grandfather and my aunt through the question, can you keep a secret? <coughs> they responded, it depends. And as a result of that, I did not disclose my secret. When I became an adult and had the platform to share my story, I knew that I need to change the dynamics of how parents and caregivers respond to the question, because if not, the child will not disclose. And I say that because in the work that I've been doing, I have adults, young people, teenagers, disclose their secret to me for the very first time. Whenever I educate people on this topic, I say to them, when someone asks you the question, can you keep a secret? It's a cry for help. You need to respond, yes, that is important. A lot of adults overcomplicate it and that is not okay. I stand here today as a survivor because of the it depends. If I had received a yes to the question, I am convinced my life would have had another journey. The reason I do what I do unpaid, I'm trying to find my healing. I'm trying to safeguard other children. If I had been healthy and whole into my adult years, I wouldn't need to be traveling the world without a paid job and all of this because I'd feel content in what I'm doing. Instead, there's that restlessness. So I tell people, when that question is asked, can you keep a secret? You respond yes, so you can hear the secret. Once you've heard it, you decide mentally what to do, and then you communicate it. So for example, there was a young girl who came to school and she said, daddy's eating my cookie. 
That was her private parts. So I encourage parents and caregivers, do not use that term, use the term private parts. Because when a child discloses that, nobody will know what they mean. Let's change the switch here. Can you keep a secret? When you say it depends, the little girl will not disclose her secret. Let's try it again. Can you keep a secret? Yes. Then she would say, daddy is eating my cookie. Then you would say, for example, I have to break your trust and phone the police. You do not phone the accused. I heard you've been sexually abusing your daughter. He's going to deny it and hide the evidence. And far too often in all different cultures, when abuse comes out, we phone the accused. Who denies it? Pastor, priest, stepfather, uncle, they deny it. What you need to do, say yes to the question, can you keep a secret to hear the secret? Once you've heard it, decide mentally what to do. Communicate (coughs) your steps to that person, child, young person, adult, and then take the steps. Don't go off and do it without communicating. They may actually recant and say that did not happen, that is not the truth. And for me personally, I am convinced when you've communicated, that child will not struggle with trust issues because you communicate it. When somebody takes your personal story, your personal business, and passes it on to someone else without your consent, trust issues will be built. I know from a survivor of abuse, I know if my grandfather had said yes, and I told him what was going on, and he communicated, I have to phone the police, not your grandmother, not your mother, Uh and he explains why, what is happening to you, Juanita? It's not okay. When he's explained it, I might be afraid and go through a lot of emotions, but he's doing the right thing. No child, young person or adult, wants to be raped or a victim of attempted rape. We want to be rescued. We want to be helped. We don't know how to communicate that. That question is a communication for help. And even if I was angry with my grandfather for a year, two years, in 10 or 20, 30 years later, I would come back and thank him. In the eyes of the law, LAW, justice would have been served. My stepfather is deceased. In the eyes of the law, LAW, it was never served. But in the eyes of the Lord, it certainly will be. Okay, just to be really clear, so um, no one is confused. Mm. Tell us the difference between molestation and rape. Most certainly. The way that I would define molestation, simplistically, it is sexual touching. Sexual abuse is a better way of looking at it. So, for example... If you touch a child sexually over or under their clothing, that is abuse. If you show a child pornography, that is abuse. If you walk around naked in front of the child, that is deemed abuse. If you're having sex and a child overhears, that is abuse. I've got to be clear that with sexual abuse, it could be touching or non-touching. Okay, mm -hmm. let me just back you up a minute here. You said if you're having sex and a child overhears, that's that's abuse. That's right. Um, You definitely have to elaborate on that because, especially here in the Caribbean, some of the houses are really small and um, you would find um, a big family living in two bedrooms and one bedrooms, you know. So explain that to us, how overhearing um, sexual relations, how does that fall into abuse? I think it's important to point out if the child accidentally stumbles upon different story, But if you are intentional, because in the law, we talk about the mens rea and the actus rea. Mens rea, guilty mind, actus rea, guilty act. The two things must be involved. If you accidentally were having sex, not that you can accidentally have sex, but you were accidentally engaging in sex and your child accidentally heard, the mental intention is absent. But when you are having sex with the intention for your child to hear that, as a form of grooming, the crime has then been committed. Because let's be realistic, sometimes in life we may pick up something that is not ours, believing it is. Legally, that usually, depending on the circumstances, is not theft because you did not have the mens rea, the mental act. You had no idea, you genuinely believed that was your property. In the same way, if people are engaging in sex accidentally, not accidentally, (laughs) and the child overhears, that is different, but when it's intentional. Because think about it, when the child overhears the sex, that is pornography. That is pornography. And we have to consider, like I was sharing, non-touching and touching can both be abuse. 
rape is sex that is very very clear here rape is sex that is actual penetration digital rape is using a person's fingers a person can be raped with objects but rape is actual sexual activity rape is sex all other types of sexual abuse may be touching or non-touching but they have not gone as far as to penetration sexual penetration that is important okay thank you for that clarification um also um how is your book doing so far how has it been received what have what are some of the feedback that you've gotten most certainly my book can you keep a secret which i have here and i'd like to show that at some point my book has been well received thus far people have had the opportunity to read to be educated empowered inspired the book shares my personal story, but more than that, it gives advice. And what I love is the way I speak today is the way the book was written. I have penned it in such a way that it is conversational. Yes, I'm an attorney, but I'm Christian first, human second. Therefore, I've written it on a human level so that people can read it and understand. A person recently heard me on the radio and they said you are simple. In my culture, simple means you're a bit of an idiot. So I said, what do you mean by simple? And he said, well, you sleep on floors, but you're a lawyer. You live simplistically. And my book is written simplistically. Wherever I go, it's the same message. It's not a lecture, it's a conversation. I'm able to engage seven-year-olds with the same message because the information is important. It's delivered in a way that is interesting. When I can engage you and you can take that information home, I've made a difference because if you start to see those flags, red signs, indicators, then you would recall what you learned from one of my presentations. All right. You know, I was really surprised to see um, David Arquette on this. It says forwarded by David Arquette. That's and right. we all know that David Arquette is basically a movie star. That's How right. did he happen upon your book? It's actually pretty amazing. There's a movie called Sold, which I would, S-O-L-D, Sold, which I would love to show whilst I'm in the country at some point. This movie I have been showing around the world. Now, as a result of that, I actually happened to be going to California, and at the same time I was going there, which is God's timing, there was actually a screening of Sold. When I posted on Facebook, I am attending Sold in Hollywood, David Arquette liked my post. Truth be told, at that time, I did not know who he was. was, okay. I did not, even though I've seen his movies. But I decided, why don't I message him? I messaged him on what's on, on uh, Facebook, on Instagram, on various mediums, Twitter. I messaged and posted on his wall to try to get his attention. Okay. He did not respond. When I went to Hollywood, I was there and I was dressed in a white dress. Everybody else was there in jeans or casual clothing, but I'm in Hollywood going to movies. So of course I'm in a white dress. I stood out like a sore thumb, which had its benefits. At the end of the movie screening, now I've seen the movie before, so I didn't sit in at the movie, but at the end there was a panel discussion. David Arquette was there and a number of other individuals who also I have been in contact with, they were at the front and they were sharing on the movie. Now, I was strategic in the fact that I stood on the side because I knew that he'd have to come up those steps to exit. I believe before going into the movie, we were sharing the same table. I met a guy who used to work for Delta, the airlines, and I was talking to a table full of men and just sharing about why I was there. And I'm sure he was on that table, but I didn't recognize him. So I asked Jane Charles, who is the producer, is David Arquette here? And she said, yes. And I was surprised because I didn't know that. <laughs> and then I recognized him at the front of the, of the movie theater. I stood to the side, and when the movie ended, he walked out. So I ran alongside him. Hi, David. I've been posting on your Facebook, on your Instagram, and he didn't know who I was. And I said to him, I'm showing you a movie in three days in two states. Can you come? And he stopped walking. He listened to me. We started speaking because I was showing his movie. In fact, two days later, I'd be showing his movie three times in two states over three days. And so I said to him, I'd love to have you come. I'd like Delta to fly you out. Unfortunately, the guy who worked for Delta subsequently left. Okay. So I was unable to arrange that. But David Arquette, actually, I gave him my business card. We took photographs together, one of which is in my book. And then a few moments later, when I left the movie screening, 
he'd actually, I gave him my card, he'd actually emailed me his mobile number. So we were in contact and he actually zoomed in. Well, it wasn't Zoom in those days, but he actually Skyped I, in and he actually attended one of my screenings. And what was amazing is because I had him attending, I could promote it. So because I'm a lawyer, I know how to stretch the truth. So I said, David Arquette is appearing because he was on computer. But I didn't okay. tell people that. So he <laughs> appeared and the room was full. We had the screening on the Tuesday, I believe, at the library, and it was full. We even had the FBI turn up for the event who wanted to collaborate. On the Wednesday, we got Google for free. We did the screening at Google on the Thursday in New York. So two screenings in DC and one in New York. And for me, it was amazing to have had that opportunity to have him be a part of my program. I've been doing screenings all around the world. We've been in touch ever since. I wrote my book, I asked him, would you write the forward? And he agreed. I was amazed by that. I asked, can I share our photo together? And he said, yes. And so I'm really grateful for the support he's given me. And even recently, I was fundraising to attend a program in the UK on tackling human trafficking, a certified course. I shared this with him and said, please tell your friends. And both him and his sister donated for me to attend the course, which I'm thankful for. I have to ask though, how has your book been received by your family members? I appreciate the question. And truth be told, when my grandmother read it, she WhatsApp to my mother. I believe she may have been in Spain. And my grandmother told my mom, the book is very well written. And I believe, if I remember correctly, she said, Juanita has been healed now, or something of the like. But what I would say, from that message my mother forwarded on to me, my grandmother was amazed at the quality and standard of my writing, and she believed that I was healed. My mother said in response to that, Juanita still needs therapy. Because my, my mother has made it clear that she wants me to have therapy. Not a few sessions, but as she says, real therapy, which means for a number of years. Her theory and understanding of therapy is it takes decades to be healed. I believe that we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I believe that Jesus is a healer. Therapy has its place and it's important. However, I'm not convinced you need years. Each person is unique and different. So for some it's years, for others it may be months, for others there is no need. I will say, however, my mother has not received it as well. She read certain sections of the book which she did not like that I had put in there. But the things I had to disclose was so that others could protect their children from X, from Y. They were necessary. When I can use a real life story, People will understand it more and accept what I have to say. If I say to a mother, for example, walking around without your top on, without anything on the top half of your body being exposed is abuse, the mother will most likely disagree with me and fight me that, verbally fight me, say I'm nuts or whatever. If I can give her a real life example of a child who was abused as a result of that, she may take me more seriously. It helps to validate what I'm sharing and what I'm saying. I will also point out, quite recently, my mother actually did say to me that she has a friend who calls her every day. That friend, my mother told me, feels sorry for my mother. My mother believes that I have written very negatively about her, which for me is a lie from the pit of hell. I believe for this book to succeed, I could not make it a black book. A black book is when you write derogatory things about a person or sexual activities you engage with a person. It is a book with secrets, a book that is not something that is positive. It is there that would destroy a person's reputation because of what it contains. In certain parts of the book, I share stories about people in my life. Now, the way I shared the story, nobody in the world would know that was my aunt, my brother, my cousin, my neighbor. They wouldn't know. Only that person would know because of how I wrote it. And I know my book is going to impact lives. It has made a definite impact thus far for those who've read it. They have been encouraged, the style of writing. But my mother doesn't see it like that. Unfortunately, my mother seems to think that I'm out to get her. When I do speaking engagements, she seems to think it's about her. She's not getting it. I even told her once, would she like me to play a mini violin for her? It's a sarcastic remark okay. we make. Let's get out the little violin. I said, it's not about you. She's making it about her. I believe that we need to be empowered. It's a lot better for my mother to speak up that she married a pedophile, that she didn't know, than to remain in the silence because she is imagining people think she's the worst person in the world. They don't think that. 
My mother did not know it was happening at the time. I have been very clear about it. In interviews, I am clear. When I speak, I am clear it was her first husband. I do all of these things, but it seems to fall on loose ground because she's not seeing how I am protecting her reputation by saying first husband, by saying she did not know. Truth be told, I could have twisted the story and say my mother knew. She was in the house when it happened, but I had no reason to throw her under the bus. So it's very difficult because I've said the truth. I've said my reality, but she's made it about her. And that is not the focus. The Bible says what the enemy intends for evil, God intends for good. I have taken what has happened to me, turned that into a book to protect other children from going through the same thing. And that is why it was written. Do you see yourself as a victim? I mean, from my interactions with you thus far, do you see yourself still as a victim? Do you think you've been healed? I would say that for myself, I'm a survivor. I use the term victim survivor interchangeably, but I prefer the term survivor because I have survived that I have come out of it. There may be vulnerabilities I still have, but I don't want to be viewed or deemed as a victim. A lot of people who don't know my story have no idea I've been abused. For those who understand about signs and identifiers of abuse victims will be able to identify that I did survive that. Many people just think I talk a lot, I'm bubbly without realizing it disguises what really went on underneath. For me personally, I would say I am healed in Jesus' name. However, despite what I went through happening so many years ago, even in my adulthood, I often struggle with anger issues, low self-esteem, insecurity. I often have insomnia. Insomnia was last night. When a person comes up to me and I talk to them and share that I didn't sleep well, I have insomnia, the usual advice is chamomile tea, Horlicks, hot milk, or Milo. Now I'm allergic to milk, so that's not helpful. And then on the back of that, they're not understanding insomnia with many of us is because of something else, something more deeper rooted. What's quite sad still, people who know I've survived abuse still tell me to take medicines or drink something, which to me I think is ridiculous because it's deep rooted. I've had people give me some um, natural herbal tablets to sleep or some gummy tablet for sleeping. That will not work. Not being rude, but that will not work because it's deep rooted. My sleep was interrupted. And for me personally, I can only sleep in a room that is dark and silent. I cannot sleep with a clock, even a small clock. I've got to remove the batteries, snoring, light, sound. I cannot sleep with any noise. I sleep without a fan, without air condition and will sweat buckets because I need silence. Some I need darkness. Some of the, um, the things you just said, um, sleeplessness, insomnia, mm. um, anger issues, and you went on to, um, are those some of the um, things that we should look out for in uh, children, especially who have suffered from child abuse? Most definitely. With signs and identifiers in small children, it may be regressive behavior, suck in the thumb or wet in the bed. With older children, for example, it may be PTSD, insomnia, low self-esteem, insecurity, suicidal ideations, uncomfortable with their body, uncomfortable getting undressed in front of others, same gender, promiscuity. What about a person who is uncomfortable being around a certain individual, an individual who is very shy, a victim who doesn't speak up, who's very quiet. They look like they are a victim. The way that they present themselves, their body language, what about somebody who's obese? Now, not every obese person has been abused. However, when you're abused, you lose control. So when you eat, you control. What about somebody cutting their wrists? Not everyone who cuts their wrists, but the point is that identifiers are different. But what I say is, when you look at the list of identifiers, victims, survivors, who I believe have not had the complete healing, will come up with about five or 10 or 20. If you look at the list of signs and identifiers in children, let's say there's 20 on the list. Even in my adulthood, I may be about 10 of them. As a small child, I used to wet the bed. I could not hold down a relationship. I could not hold down a job. I was not very good at holding friends. I have a lot of sort of walls that I place up to protect myself. So when I meet people, depending on what I receive from them, male or female, I may be very friendly and warm or I may be standoffish. People sometimes misread that. 
often the anger issue seeps out. Somebody recently told me, when I first met you, you said hi, and that was it. Now, number one, I didn't know them. So even though I meet people and I may respond differently, that was my first time meeting them, I said hi. And for me, I'm quite insecure. So therefore, when I met them, yes, they were female, but I was a bit reserved, a bit shy. I don't know if they know anything about me. When you do the work I do and you're often in the media, I sometimes am more reserved when meeting a new person because I'm wondering, do they know my story? What do they know about me? And so because of that, I may be a little bit more reserved. I don't believe that's because of abuse. It's because I'm concerned of how I'll be perceived. And so there are times when I may speak very little and may come across standoffish. It's not that at all. It's more reservation. And then there are other times when I may meet somebody and open up. It just depends. But I don't believe that's because of the abuse. I believe it's a level of caution. Because for me, I don't live in fear. I associate with men and women. I have a lot of friends who are male. I live with strangers all the time. So I don't have any paranoia. But there is that reservation because I don't know how you perceive me. And then also when I walk into a room, maybe I don't think I look great. Maybe I don't like my hairstyle. Maybe I'm feeling ugly today. So it's all of that. How are you perceiving me? So for our viewers who are watching, how would you advise anyone to respond to a disclosure of child sexual abuse? The first thing I believe you've got to do is to believe the child. Believe the child. Quite often when we hear about abuse, it's by somebody that you know. So disbelief sets in. Why would a four-year-old lie? Why would a five-year-old lie? Sometimes they do. But where would they even have the language to disclose that? How would they even know to talk about those things in the detail in which they do? Believe the child. Real quick, to answer that question for you, there are children out there who have access to all this information. Unfortunately. And they also use it as a way to either get back at a parent or a family member mm -hmm. for some thing they would have probably done just to get them into trouble. There are people like that. So how do you go from believing to being cautious in how you approach this? Because let's say, for instance, that we do what you say and we believe. You ask no questions. We do what you say and we call the authorities, not knowing or hearing the other side first. And of course, we have to make our children first priority. Their safety is the first mm -hmm, priority. Mm -hmm. We go with what you say and we contact the police. We bring them in, all right? And we, let's say we confront, the police confront the abuser. And it is proven and shown that it is not the case. And the child then admits that, okay, it didn't happen. I said that because he didn't give this to me or I asked him to buy me this and he didn't. Where does that leave the abuser? Because in that case, if information had gotten out that the police questioned him or her about that situation, somebody's reputation is destroyed right mm -hmm. there. So are we still going to first and foremost believe and trust before we do any kind of, um, I, I use the word investigation lightly here. Tell me. I appreciate the question. However, I'm still going to stick with my guns and say believe the child. The vast majority of children do not lie. It's like when we say, you know, that when a lady has made the comment about being raped and it's her partner, well, that's not really what happened. That's not how it went down. We often blame the victim, often disbelieve. The first thing, you go on the internet, you research every single organization that is out to protect children, out to advise parents, the first thing they say, believe the child. When I wrote my book, I had to follow the rules, believe the child. If the child is lying, let the police deal with that. You mentioned investigation and I hear what you're saying, but that's not our place. Let the police investigate. Because if that child is making false allegations, the police need to be involved. Because if we don't deal with that now, they will do that again later. And later and who knows if the evidence says otherwise then that individual when that child is now an adult may go down for something they didn't do so it's important to allow the police because what happens unfortunately from what you're describing and even my experience an allegation is made 
the parents or family members have disbelief, they investigate it themselves, the perpetrator never is seen by the police, never seen by the court, that person can go on to reoffend. If, for example, there was a sexual offenders registry in the UK, my stepfather would not be on it. He could get employment with children because we investigated. Forget that investigation. My stepfather could have raped and abused other girls. Would I feel responsible? No, I would not because I did my part. I tried to communicate, but I was maybe disbelieved or there was fear, shame and stigma. At the end of the day, children very, very rarely admit that they've been abused if that hasn't happened. Yes, they have the internet, but we've got to use wisdom here. The description that they give, is it first person, third person? You can tell when somebody is speaking from experience or what they saw on telly or what they heard because of the nature and the extent to which they describe. I say when we listen, don't just use your ears, use your eyes. What about body language? There are ways to communicate to the child to uncover whether that story has any truth in it. But of course, there are steps to be taken. The police will investigate. The police will interview that child. The police will not arrest without sufficient evidence. They're not just going to go up and arrest Mr. X, Mr. Y on the basis of what has been said. There has to be evidence. A person is not charged without evidence, and if they are and found innocent, then often they're able to be repercussions, positive repercussions for them, compensation for the child, there'll be negative repercussions. But let me ask mm. you something. In the case where you have, let's say, a father is abusing his daughter, mm -hmm. you call in the police. The police, they're not going to lock them up right away. What happens if the father is still living in the house? How how is that going to affect the child? Isn't there likely to be some sort of um, situation where either he convinces the mother and then the mother convinces the child and there's some abusers that are the breadwinner in the family where the first thing they're going to consider is, okay, if daddy goes to jail, who's going to take care of us? What do you say, what do we do in, in that situation? Well, the challenge is that every country has different laws and different provisions. In the UK, that doesn't happen. If there has been an allegation, the child is removed immediately. It's non-negotiable. The child is removed and placed in foster care, placed in a care home, they are removed. In other cultures, that doesn't exist, and that's where the issue lies. Because the challenge is, if the child stays in the home, the child may take their own life. The child may recant their allegation. The child may be brutalized even more. It is very difficult, but despite that, the first thing I say, irrespective of the what-ifs, we have an obligation to be our brother's keeper. When we hear of an allegation, regardless of the, the, the affairs, regardless of possible regrets and all that, we need to take the first steps, listen, communicate to the child what you're going to do, phone the police. Don't worry about anything else. Because even if, God forbid, nothing happens, the child would at least thank you, not right away, but many years later, you tried. You tried. Yes, you failed, but you tried. Because at the end of the day, we look at what goes on around us and make a determination as to whether am I to blame? Is it the system? A lot of victims and survivors struggle with blame. When you're a victim, you did nothing wrong. But oh, if I told the police this, if I wasn't dressed this way, a lot of blame. But at least when you've done your part, the child would have a little bit less blame because they know, well, my aunt, my uncle, whoever, they did try, they called the police, the police threw out the case, insufficient evidence. But at least we did our best. For me, the police were involved. The police asked us if we wanted to proceed further. They said the court will most likely throw the case out. So we decided not to proceed. I'm angry about that to this day. Why? Because in hindsight, I should not have said to them, let's throw out the case. Let's forget about it. I should have said, let's just try. As a Christian, as a believer, I would not have said that. I wasn't Christian at the time I was a church girl. I became Christian at 15. For me, if I had known differently, if I had been strong in my Christian walk, then I would have said, no, let's try. Because I believe that we do our part, God will do the rest. Think about it. The police are not in control. It's the judge, the jury. But as a young person, the police persuaded me, well, what do you want to do? I think that's so wrong. Allow the judge to decide, not me. Let the judge make the decision. 
And so I regret that because in the eyes of the law, no, no, nothing happened. No justice was served. I never thought about it before, but he could have abused other children. That wouldn't be my responsibility. That would be on the police because they should have allowed us to continue on and allow the judge, the jury to decide. Why did they place that decision in my hands? I was not a law student. I was not a lawyer. I did not understand things the way I do today. Exactly. What is the one thing, if you could go back, with how you, um, with everything that you've gone through, mm. from the time you were abused to now, what's the one thing that you would change? I think the one regret, I am not responsible for being abused whatsoever. The one regret I have, on one occasion, my mother and my stepfather had an argument. He ended up coming upstairs. In the night, I woke up because he was snoring beside me. He was in my bed. I came downstairs. I pushed open the living room door. The chair was barricading the door. I told my mother, because she opened her eyes, my stepfather's in my room. My mom looked at me with bloodshot eyes because she had been sleeping, and she went back to sleep. She denies that to today. I came back upstairs. I went into the living room, into her bedroom, sorry, and I sat curled up on her wicker chair. And unfortunately, at that young age, however young I was, there was no CSI, crime scene investigation. As a young child, I used to watch for FBI files and other such programs. At that time, showing my age, there was no CSI. If there was CSI, I would have known about DNA evidence. I would have known that there is sufficient evidence. My stepfather was in my bed. I could have telephoned the police and there would be sufficient evidence. It doesn't mean to say he would have been charged, but there was sufficient evidence. It would have raised questions. Also, my stepfather, when he abused me during my sleep, he would put his tongue in my ear. There'd be DNA. That DNA, they would say, well, why would there be any DNA in Juanita's ear? There may have been his fibers on my clothes, transference, and of course he engaged sexually. The point I'm saying, my ear and my clothing, DNA. Him in the bed, evidence. That's my only regret. I wish I had phoned the police. When I was younger, I would call the police and put the phone down for the fun of it. I don't know how that was fun, that's what I did. But on this occasion, that would have been the best time to have telephoned the police and spoken to them. They would come to the house, they would knock on the door, I would open it secretly, and then they would come up and see the evidence. That is my only regret, because if that had happened, for all we know, he could have been imprisoned. Things could have been very, very different to how they are today. However, despite that, I believe my journey would have taken another journey, and I would not be here today. And although I may be unemployed, unpaid, volunteering, sleeping on floor, backpacking and roughing it. You are I, changing lives. That's my point. I love what I do. And if things have been different, I could be a rich lawyer in the US or maybe in the UK doing something else, making lots of money, being fulfilled, but not changing lives. Just as you said, my NGO is changing cases. I want to change the world. There are many Christians who are wonderful people, but they're not impacting the world. I am impacting the world. And so despite the negatives, I have turned it around and I love what I do. So I'm focusing on the positives, not on that one regret. Okay. So when you're not doing public speaking on child sexual abuse and human trafficking, what do you do to just relax? What do you fun? What do you like doing? For me, I absolutely love to read books. I love crime fiction. I'm a huge CSI fan. I like to read psychological thrillers. I'm not into horrors, but I love detective books. I studied a year of police studies. It was my dream to be a police officer. I like to investigate. That's just my dream. And so for me, when I read these books, I put myself in the shoes. I don't watch television. I'm not interested in any of that. But I do sometimes go on the internet and I watch these documentaries, murder mysteries. Even in childhood, I was very much interested in crime solving, crime busting probably because I was abused I want to rescue okay. I want to be a helper and that's very much what I love to do I'm a chef and a vegan vegan means I don't eat animals or animal products I only eat plants soy protein I have my b12 I have my protein I'm a very healthy vegan nothing medically wrong but I dream of doing a lot of great things and my passion for food for baking I'm a chef too I love to cook but my passion reading cooking, baking, eating in restaurants is the best part. Vegan restaurants where you can have vegan cheesecake, vegan dessert, vegan milkshake. 
I also really enjoy fellowshipping with others. I'm an only child, and it has been very lonely growing up with a mother who's a busy teacher and a pedophile stepfather. And I love board games. I love board games. I don't play them by myself. I used to. Now I'm an adult. I just wait for someone to come around and hang out. But I do love to play. I love to spend time with others because in my childhood, it was very, very lonely. It was me and the imaginary friends that didn't exist. Okay. And of course, sometimes when you've been abused, you push away people. So now that I'm an adult, I love that time to fellowship. I love worship. When I'm at church or events, worship, corporal worship, meaning singing songs, is a beautiful thing. I'm, I guess, a sort of slightly legalistic Christian in the sense where if it ain't in the Bible, I'm not doing it. If it ain't Christian, I'm not interested. Some of the books I read, maybe there's some concerns because they have certain sex scenes. And as a strong believer, I believe in sex after marriage, not before. But I skip those parts. For me, I love to be entertained. But I believe in using wisdom and what I expose myself to, what I listen to. And if it honors God, I'm all for that. Okay. And you also told me that you, your dream is to open a bakery. I thought Don't you were going to say your dream is to get married. I was like, what you were going to say? It's awkward. That's that too. <laughs> of course, in God's timing. Actually, it's funny you say that. I've got a crush on someone in your country, but I won't say their name. I don't uh, even know their okay. name. <laughs> the mystery guy. Have you guy. spoken to him at least? I can't say because then he might say, that's me, the mystery okay, guy. Okay, no, you don't have to tell me what, he, what you spoke about, but have you spoken to him at least? Any kind of interaction? Well, actually, or you just saw him and said, yeah. The first question, does he exist, number one? And did you see him on the internet, number two? He exists. I met him in real life. And I was so nervous, I couldn't even say my name. No, wow. that's a joke. <laughs> but no, I have met him in real life. He's very handsome and I've got a major crush. Is it God's will? I don't have the answer to that one. Well, if it is, it'll happen. <laughs> if it is, it'll but, happen. But in all truthfulness, my dream, besides the husband, of course, that is a dream. But one of my dreams when I grow up is to get a paid job. That is my dream. To get a paid job and to not have to quit that job just so that I can do my ministry. Okay. I had a job. I quit it on Friday. I booked my flight on Saturday. I left on Wednesday. Back in January, I had a job. I quit on the 31st of Jan. I got on a flight two days later. I should not have to quit jobs to continue my ministry. Okay. So I desire for a, for a paid job. My dream is to do this full time, to speak, to be paid to speak, that I don't have to rough it and sleep on floors. My second dream is to build safe houses in the Philippines. Why the Philippines? It's number one for cyber sex trafficking, which is where boys and girls are sexually abusing each other in front of a webcam for usually a white male in the UK, US, Australia, Korea. My third and most important dream is to build bakeries with open hiring policy. Open hiring policy is that I want to hire former homeless people, former prostitutes, and ex-convicts. I was recently in a prison in Belle Isle in St. Vincent, and I had the opportunity to share my message on human trafficking and child abuse to the individuals who were in the prison. I was so honored for that opportunity. The respect that they gave me was truly amazing. I really did not expect to be respected as much as I was in an all-male prison. I shared my message to boys and young men in Trinidad, and they make inappropriate jokes. They mess about. They talk sometimes and distract one another. So to go to a prison and for them to respond with intelligence, to be articulate in their responses, I was amazed by that. And like I said to them, if I get land in your country, I'll build my bakery and you'll be welcome. I told them, I believe in John 316. I believe in prison and jail time, but I believe in second chances. I told them, I do not believe in the death penalty. I believe in opportunities to have a new life and a new start, but I'm not naive. Prison is for you, for now, but I believe that there is a greater future. And what was amazing is I was able to stand and say to them, I do not see you as criminals. I see you as human beings, maybe with a tendency to rape, human beings with a tendency to rob, human beings with a tendency to steal. I said there's life and death in the tongue. When I see you as a human being with a tendency to, you have the power to change. When I call you a pedophile, that is your name and that's all you can aspire to be. And even when they were there, I just, I fell in love with them platonically. I, some of them, there was one guy, he has sort of dreadlocks short and he was nodding and I was so encouraged by him. And in another life, in another generation, in another time, we may have been friends. And I looked at these men, I don't know their infraction, but I can tell you the truth from the bottom of my heart, I saw people. 
I was there with one staff member who was male and a companion. There was three of us. And then there was another lady and another person. Let's say there was two ladies, myself and two males. There was about 50 prisoners. They could have raped, attacked me, done anything they like. My companion said there were security cameras. I said to him, the security cameras will not protect me. They record the evidence. Yes. These men could have done anything they liked. Truth be told, of course they could have. We were outnumbered. But I went there without a spirit of fear, about a pile never sound mind. And one of the staff said to me, you were very comfortable. I said, of course I am. Because to me, the God that I serve protects me. When you've traveled eight years without a paid job, living with strangers, sleeping on floors, not being raped, robbed, or murdered, you can't have fear because you know that your God is protecting every hair on your head. So when I went there, I had no fear. I was honored. Even one of the prisoners we high-fived, it's this hand, we high-fived twice. I have touched a prisoner. It was oh, wow. amazing. For me, it was an honor. They respected me. They had questions. I don't know their infractions. It doesn't matter. I've been around criminals before. They are human beings. And like I told them, the only reason you're here is because you got caught. There are so many criminals on the outside. You got caught. But I said, I believe in you. If I have a bakery here, you are welcome. And I meant that from the bottom of my heart. Alrighty. So I hope you know, there's an opportunity for you to stay um, here in St. By the way, it is St. Vincent. That's right. Not Sin Vincent. A lot of people, <laughs> not a lot of people say that. It's actually St. Vincent. I like that. St. Vincent. Well, I'm here, yes. so it is St. Oh. <laughs> All right. So tell our viewers where we can get a copy of your book. Most if, certainly. If it's available in stores, where exactly can we get it? And I see you have a t-shirt. You right. bought a t-shirt with you also. And it's can you keep a secret? Can you keep a secret? My book, actually, what's quite amazing. Now, as you've heard, I'm a strong Christian. The Bible says, ask and it shall be given. And the Bible also says, you don't get because you don't ask. When I was in the prison with these amazing human beings who have committed crimes, made mistakes, been on the wrong side of the law, but in my eyes and in God's eyes, they're amazing human beings with the possibility and capacity to change. One of them said, can I have your book? And I looked at my companion, Mr. Games, and I looked back at the guy and I said to Mr. Games, what do we do? Even though it was my book, I, I said, what do we do? He looked at me, I looked at him. I looked back at the criminal, as people would say, I looked at him and I asked him, I leaned forward, why do you want the book? He's like, to read it. Now, of course, that's an obvious thing, but people often ask me for a free book. When I do interviews on radio, can we have a book? Well, no, you can't. Why? Even though the book was printed in India at low cost, 60, that's six zero, 60% 60 of the profits raised from the book and t-shirts will be used to build safe houses in the Philippines. Truth be told, I, I'm transparent and frank, truth be told, when the criminal, as people would see him, as the criminal asked me for the book, my heart said, of course, absolutely. My mind was like, well, I am happy to give him the book right now. However, that is 60% of profits I've just lost. But I'll be honest and say it again, when he asked me, my desire was to give it to him for free. However, by the grace of God, when I looked at Mr. Games, he said, I will sponsor not one, but five books. I That's autographed awesome. the book, gave it to the gentleman, and then we wrote and I signed and provided the other four books to the prison before we left. And it was amazing to have been able to give them that. They have no reading materials. But the best part of the story is this book is going to encourage them, inspire them. It is my story. The book will transform lives. There's certain things in that book. I don't want to say it on air. But certain things in the book that will change their lives. Life transforming material is in this book. Mr. Games has been supporting me throughout my journey. And the book is available in his bookstore. It is 70, 70, 70 EC, 60% of profits will be going to build the safe houses in the Philippines. Same with the t-shirt. It's all for a good cause. As you've heard, I'm currently unemployed, hopefully not for much longer, but despite my status of unemployment, I'm still willing to give away 60% because it's all for a good cause. Okay, and I also heard there's a song out called That's Can You right. Keep a Secret? I actually saw the video, the music video for the song. And I have to say, it's real deep. I am telling you, and it speaks and it hints a little on uh, child molestation and sexual abuse and all of that. And if it's something, you should check it out. Uh, definitely try and grab a copy 
of the book, Can You Keep a Secret, by Miss Juanita Headley. And we want to thank you so much for coming, uh, for, for talking with us. Um, is there anything you'd like to say real quick before we go? Most certainly. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Besides the fact that you want to get married. That's right. Of course, <laughs> single and ready to mingle, so long as he's a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not a Christian thing, because many say, Lord, Lord, many call themselves Christian, but as the Bible says, by their fruits you will know him. Him, her, the fruit of the person demonstrates. So, of course, I'm not looking for the husband. The Bible says, he who finds a wife, not one needs to find a good thing. A husband. Definitely. Exactly. So, yes. <laughs> I love that approach. I love <laughs> that approach. Aside from the husband that will come in God's time and not mine, what I would love to say is I'm very grateful for the support I've had thus far. Mandisa Stevens has been my host. She's been very generous, providing me delicious vegan meals. I have been very blessed to stay with her, to be given a room not a floor, to be given a room and to be fed and watered. So I have to thank her. Also, Superintendent Junior Simmons, who has helped me to set up some of my programs. I appreciate his support. Also, Pastor Ferdinand from the New Testament Church of God, who has opened up his church for me to speak. And last, but by no means least, I really have to thank Mr. Gaines from Gaines Bookstore, he has been amazing. Words are insufficient to describe. He has sacrificed so much. He sponsored the five books for the prison. He was the first person to buy a book. He has been my driver, companion, friend, accountability partner, uncle in the Lord. And as I told him, I loved him from the bottom of my heart. I know that he'll be sorely missed when he goes to meet the Lord by everyone in this nation. He is so sincere. The Bible talks about love in 1 Corinthians. And I say, and I will say it on air, that if you want to look in the dictionary for the meaning of love, Mr. Game's name should be there. He's only a stranger to me. We've known each other less than two weeks, but he has gone above and beyond. Me being here on the program today is because of Jesus Christ using Mr. Games. Me being at the prison, again, Jesus Christ through Mr. Games. He has blessed me so much. And so I really have to give honor where honor is due. I thank him from the bottom of my heart. But also, since I'm here until the 10th, Lord willing, longer, I want to give you my contact information in the event that you know of anywhere I can speak on this topic. My contact number is 454-1693, 454-1693. My Facebook is Changing Cases, Changing, C-A-S-E-S, -E my website, changingcases.org, that's changing, C-A-S-E-S dot org, and again, my number, 454 one six nine three i speak seven days a week all throughout the nation i speak anywhere in the world i do not charge but donations are appreciated and needed if you'd like a copy of my book you can reach out to me you can tell me your story tell me your secret so please do reach out to me this is an important message i should not have to give up my job to be here i've made that sacrifice i love what i do and i look forward to hopefully sharing my story with you sharing my knowledge and expertise at a venue where there'll be people willing to listen and give me that platform to share, to educate, to empower, and to safeguard the children in your world. My name is Jillian Crookshank, and we thank you so much for joining us in the spotlight on IKTV Channel 112.